Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from wherever you have called in. We're really pleased that you're here. My name is Pat Furlong, and I'm from PPMD, and we're welcoming today the Anasense Therapeutics Group. Uh, Mark Diamond is here, as as well as his his colleague, Nukat Desim, and they're, they have considerable experience in drug development. And I think for our community, this might feel a little confusing with Anasense Therapeutics and our, our antisense oligonucleotides that are exon skipping drugs. These, the drug ATL1102 that they're going to present to you has a different mode of action. So I hope you'll listen. This is a great opportunity, and this particular approach would apply to every young man with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So with that, I turn it over to Mark Diamond to begin. Mark? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pat uh, and the team at uh, PPMD uh, for the opportunity to speak today on Anisense Therapeutics uh, Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy Program. Uh, our uh, focus today uh, on, in our presentation will be on the results of our uh, Phase two clinical trial of our drug AT1102 that we tested in uh, non-ambulant boys with Duchenne's uh, in a study that we conducted here in Australia at the Royal Children's Hospital in uh, Melbourne. As you say, Pat, uh, joining me on uh, today's presentation call, uh, uh, Nuket Desen. Uh, Nuket is the Director of uh, Clinical and Regulatory Affairs at Anisense Therapeutics. And we will also have uh, Dr. Gil Price, who's our uh, Medical Director. So uh, in the presentation today, I'll give a, a short introduction to the company and on the Duchenne program. Uh, then I'll hand over to uh, Nuket, who will take you through the results of our phase two clinical trial. Uh, I'll come back on the call a little later just to talk around next steps with the program and also uh, in, have uh, Gil come onto the call to give his sort of perspective on, on the program and views on the, on the steps uh, moving forward. So, uh, Anything Therapeutics is a publicly traded company on the Australian Stock Exchange. And uh, consequently, uh, in today's presentation, uh, I will be making statements about the ongoing development of anti-sense uh, therapeutics program in Duchenne's. And so, accordingly, those statements should be considered uh, at uh, risk statements. The company is uh, based in uh, Melbourne, Australia, and our focus is on developing and commercialising our antisense pharmaceuticals that uh, we have in our pipeline. Uh, we have two uh, antisense drugs that we call AT1102 and AT1103. Uh, these compounds have come via a long-standing uh, development co collaboration that we have with a US-based company called Ionis Pharmaceuticals. For those unfamiliar with Ionis, they are recognized as a, a world leader in the field of antisense drug development and commercialization. And we have uh, worldwide exclusive licenses from Ionis to develop and commercialize our antisense drugs for all uh, disease indications. So while, as I said, we have uh, two drugs in our pipeline, including our drug AT1103, Today's uh, presentation will, of course, then focus on our drug AT1102 that we uh, are developing for Duchenne. As uh, Pat, you uh, correctly uh, pointed out, AT1102 is, a, is different than uh, a, the uh, oligonucleotide that are uh, yeah, currently being used in the treatment of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, those that are used as um, exon skipping agents to increase the levels of dystrophin. Our antisense drug works by uh, blocking the production of a protein that is uh, expressed on human white blood cells. Uh, this uh, protein is called uh, CD49D. Uh, CD49D is a receptor on these lymphocytes and its role is to allow these uh, lymphocytes to be able to move 
from the blood and uh, migrate into sites of inflammation. And it's the, the binding of this receptor onto the, the blood vessel walls uh, that allows these cells to push through the blood vessel walls and into into these sites of inflammation, which, of course, in Duchenne's here, we're considering uh, the muscle tissues. And so uh, antisense, uh, our antisense drug stops the production of this uh, receptor on the lymphocytes. It stops these lymphocytes going into the tissues and thereby kind of blocking the, the, uh, uh, the adverse effects of the inflammation on the muscles. Uh, HC1102, uh, we've uh, previously tested the drug in patients with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis and shown the drug to be very potent at, uh, in reducing inflammatory brain lesions in MS patients. And that data has been uh, published in the, in the Journal of Neurology. Uh, what had us move our uh, program into Duchenne's was a very important uh, a publication that's noted here uh, in skeletal muscle where the researchers, uh, French and Brazilian researchers, identified that Duchenne's boys that had uh, a greater number of white blood cells or, or lymphocytes that had high levels of this protein or receptor CD49D on their cell surface actually had a, a much more rapid and severe progression of their disease. And so it was this view of the researchers and their identification of the potential role of CD49D uh, in Duchenne's that had us consider moving our uh, drug into uh, this disease uh, indication. Uh, what we know is, is that the uh, corticosteroids uh, appear to have uh, no effect on the uh, CD49D expressing cells. So no effect on the number of cells that express it, nor do they modulate or you know, block the expression of the CD49D on these T cells. So uh, we are working with a program that is, uh, it looks to be working through a very unique uh, mechanism to treat the inflammation in Duchenne. And in fact, we're the only group that has in clinical development, a drug that targets this uh, important receptor in uh, in clinical development for this for this disease. So, you know, we're very excited about the prospects for this for this drug. Uh, we started the program initially in non-ambulant patients, and that was with the understanding that. From the work done here by uh, Pinto Mariz and colleagues, that, that the non-ambulant boys appear to have higher levels of this uh, target of our drug CD49D, so we thought that that would make them most eligible for the use of uh, of our drug. So uh, that's really the the background to to the program that we were looking to share with you today. I'm going to hand over at this point to uh, Niketa Sam to get Niketa to take you through the uh, study that we ran at the World Children's Hospital in Melbourne and uh, what we think is you know, very encouraging clinical data that we reported uh, very recently and, and also then talking to what would be the next steps of this program uh, now that we've completed this study. So uh, thanks, Niketa. I'll, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thanks, Just before you go, uh, uh, or uh, Nuket, could you tell us, you talked about skeletal muscle and, and the target in skeletal muscle for the CD49D uh, on the T-cells, but does this target the heart at all as well? And if you'll comment on that, it would be helpful. Sure. So yeah. the, uh, you know, we know that, um, is, that this is the drug is affecting uh, leukocytes, lymphocytes, you know, uh, that are expressed, you know, in, in all tissues. So to the extent that, you know, the lymphocytes, you know, are likely to be, you know, have, have a role in the infl inflammation of the heart, then yes, they would, they would be, you know, they would be implicated. So it's possible, you know, uh, that we you know, could expect uh, to see uh, some ca cardiac benefits with this drug as a, as a consequence. Good. Thank you. 
Right. Thank you very much. I, and I'm very um, pleased to be able to share the, the results of our um, study with you all today. So the clinical study that we've just completed was a phase two open label study where we looked at safety, efficacy and the pharmacokinetic profile of our drug ATL1102 um, in non-ambulatory um, fish end patients. The study's primary objective was to look at safety and tolerability and the dose that we um, applied in this study was 25 milligram, which was administered once weekly um, by a subcutaneous injection for 24 weeks. Um, our secondary objectives were to look at our um, potential to modulate the lymphocytes um, as, as our mechanism of action. We also looked at um, PK profile, which is basically where we assess the concentration of the drug in the blood. And we looked at um, functional, so we looked at also, you know, disease progression parameters. So even though it was a very short study, we wanted to have a look at our capacity to affect the functional capacity in our participants, any effects on respiratory function, and of course, on quality of life. As I mentioned, with the single centre open label study, we conducted it here in Melbourne. Australia at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute um, and our principal investigator was uh, Dr. Ian Woodcock. Our sample size was only nine participants for this study and the key target population for inclusion into this study were participants that were diagnosed with uh, DMD and had been non ambulant for at least three months before um, being screened for this study. Uh, the boys we were targeting were to the age between 10 and 18 years of age with a body weight of 25 um, kilograms minimum and uh, up to 65 kilograms. Okay, can you just give us your definition of non-ambulatory for three months? Is that, could they, were they, did you accept patients who were able to stand or or uh, transfer from their chair to their bed, or was it a person who had not been able to walk for three months at all? No, they, they could stand or, or um, could potentially walk slightly, but not, not very ambulant at all. Yeah. Thank you. So here I just wanted to give you a sense of what the demographics of our boys look like in the study. Obviously, um, all nine patients were male. Um, in terms of age, we had a mean age of 14.9 with a range of, from 12 years to 18 years of age. Um, and the time since non-ambulant, that range, so we had a median of 2.2 years with um, a range of 0.6 to 9.2 years. A majority of our boys were on corticosteroid medications, so they were, um, as long as they were on a stable dose, again, for um, at least three months before being screened for the study, um, boys were allowed to join whether they were on um, corticosteroid or not. And of our participants, eight were receiving corticosteroid treatment with three on prednisolone and five on court, and one participant had never received corticosteroid treatment. So as um, we're very pleased, our study met our primary endpoint and the drug appears in the study to have shown to be generally safe and well tolerated. We had no serious adverse events reported. We had no participants withdrawn from the study. We did, um, we reported 136 treatment emergent adverse events, um, and all boys had at least one adverse event. Of these 136, 114 were considered to be related to the study medication, and that could that could mean whether it was possibly, probably, definitely, or even unlikely. I've grouped into that um, number, and 22 were considered not related by our investigators. So 100, uh, 
in the um, AEs reported, 131 were considered to be of mild severity, so a high proportion of them were um, just mild in nature. We had a total of two patients that reported two treatment emergent adverse events of moderate severity and three adverse events that were considered to be of severe um, intensity. The most commonly reported um, treatment emergent adverse events we saw in the study were injection site erythema, some skin discoloration, some pain, bruising and swelling at the injection site. All of these injection site reactions and the skin discoloration were all reported to be mild in severity. And when the patients were followed up for that skin discoloration, which was a, a slightly unexpected um, outcome in this study, uh, it was resolved in the four participants by the end of the study and it was um, basically resolved, resolving um, in the last, the remaining two participants in the study. In this table, I just present to you to give you a, you know, a sense of the nature of the adverse events that were reported. Any adverse events that were reported in um, two or more participants uh, uh, summarised here and might be a good opportunity for us to um, introduce our medical director, uh, Gil. If maybe he can add a little bit more um, insight into the safety data of the study. Yeah, thanks, Nikette. So, um, I'm just trying, I'm having a wee bit of trouble with the screen, but um, just as you're going down and looking at these treatment emergent adverse events, it may, uh, on the one, sorry? Apologies, I think I moved it. Yeah, no worries. So I think, Nukette, your question was to, to talk a little bit about the treatment emergent adverse events. Um, so, so just for definition, an adverse event is anything that is different than when you were uh, enrolled at baseline. So it can be anything. It can be a, a temperature change. It can be, you know, uh, uh, a, a bruise that you see for the first time. And so when you talk about the number of events, this on the surface of it maybe looks like a large number, but it actually isn't. Uh, just to give you a comparator, I'm working on a study, a larger study, but a study now where there are over 8,000 uh, events that have been recorded. So so I hope that that helps sort out or, or give you a, a bit of comfort that the, num the actual number of events here is really relatively small. Yeah, so Gil, it's Pat. And just a couple questions around there. Uh, most of the, sure. most of what I see in your ad, in your in your adverse events are side erythema, pain and swelling and some bruising. Um, these boys, um, we we all we have had different studies where there have been subcutaneous injections, um, and and that we do see their skin flaring up a little bit and and some erythema around around the injection site. So I just want to know is you know once a few days had passed or a day or so had passed. This all lessened and went away. Is that right? You know, I think some of this is skin sensitivity. Some of this is is it perhaps other reasons in, in terms of that we maybe haven't uncovered about the skin sensitivity and the reactivity that they have. But we do see this with subcutaneous injection. So I wonder if you could just comment on whether it healed, did it cause scarring, um, what happened, and what, how yeah, long? Yeah, yeah. So uh, go go ahead and okay. I'll just add um, quickly that uh, the the reason why we had so many injection site reactions is because on each injection, um, the boys would have a little bit of erythema, a bit of pain or swelling at the site, and these normally resolved within a day or two of the injection. So then on the next weekly injection, they'd have a little bit of a um, reaction, and then that would resolve and, and so forth. And that's, that's one of the reasons why we had the so many in terms of the injection site reactions. The majority of the AEs were reported, as you can see here, were um, injection site reactions. Um, yeah. And skin there, discolor there was, yep. And there was no scarring, you can't? No scarring. No scarring. The skin discoloration was the only thing that, you know, was sort of followed very closely because it was it lasted throughout the study and it came on at various stages in the in boys. So um, 
it ranged from day 29 to day 81 um, when it, when we saw the onset. And then, as I mentioned before, there was no there was no discomfort. None of the boys withdrew because of it. There was no pain, no discomfort, no skin breakdown associated with the skin discoloration. The DSMB for the study monitored these um, patients throughout our study and were very comfortable with um, that it was mostly a cosmetic. And we had dermatology follow-up for these patients. So... um, Thank you so much much for elaborating on that. I appreciate it. Right. I'll just go to my next slide. Sure. So it it brings us to obviously our efficacy parameters that we monitored in the study. And um, these included... As I mentioned earlier, the lymphocyte modulation um, potential of our drug, looking at assessing the number and percentages of lymphocytes, um, including CD4, what we call CD4 and CD8 T cells, and these within these T cell subgroups, looking at the levels of CD49D, you know, the ones that were expressed in levels of CD49D higher levels. Um, we also looked at the functional capacity, and to evaluate this, we um, assess muscle function using the performance of upper limb test tool, the pull two. We also used um, Meditate to look at hand function, and that was using the my set um, tools to do that. We looked at evaluation of muscle strength um, using again the my set tools for uh, my grip and my pinch. And finally, we also had a look at respiratory function, which um, included looking at um, peak expiratory flow and percent predicted fourth vital capacity in the boys. We looked at quality of life as well. And in the next slide, I can share more data on these with you. So with our uh, lymphocytes, we, we looked across a number of different um, population of these cells and what we found was that, that consistently we saw mean reductions in a number of um, lymphocytes, including our T lymphocytes, which are the CD3 positive and CD3, um, CD4 positive and CD3, CD8 positive cells. But most importantly, these cells that were expressing levels of CD49 days. And these were measured throughout the study um, at weeks 8, 12, and 24, which was at the end of day three. And we saw that um, there was that consistent decline over the 24 weeks. But interestingly, we also saw a bit of a rebound in the numbers of these T cells um, from their starting, from around starting levels post um week 28. So that was an interesting um, observation. And then this basically um, confirms or demonstrates that the positive effects um, that the drug is having on the CD49D expressing lymphocytes in the blood um, during treatment, you know, as, as we had anticipated um, being the mechanism of our drug action. And here is the um, mean data from this, which just highlights how um, if you look at the second column where it shows the change at 24 weeks at the end of dosing, you can see that all of the cell populations um, described in the slide earlier are on a decline. And when you look at um, that change from week 24 to 28, you can see that in the CD4, at CD3, CD49D cells, we have a, um, a significant um, change from that time point. So, uh, you can't did, so it, they certainly did rebound back um, at the 28-week mark. Are these young men then, were they put on an extended access program or the study stopped? So, these young boys, the study stopped. 
um, at that site because it was our first, it was our first time going in and that, that sort of, um, by the time we collated all the data and assessed, the boys had already come off the study and had their follow-up period completed. Thank you. So, as I mentioned before, we did look at the um, pool two as a um, assessment for motor function. But here, what we I just wanted to share with you, just an interesting. This is an exploratory um, observation that we saw um, when we looked into the data. And what we found is that there was some correlation, or appears to be a correlation, in the boys responding. Um, in their pool two scores where they're uh, a positive, uh, an increase. This is, represents a change in the pool two score at 24 weeks where a positive, um, change or a zero mean either stabilization or an improvement for the boys. And what it sort of shows us if you can have a look on in that, um, graph that, that's there on the slide. The boys that showed that rebound between weeks 24 and um, 28 tended to also be the boys that had a, a, a either a, a stabilisation or a positive change in their full two scores, while those that um, didn't have a, a score, had a negative change tended to be those that didn't have that rebound effect. Now that's something that we've just it's just an observation and it needs to obviously be explored a lot further and we'll look at that in a bit more detail in the next upcoming um, clinical trial. Yeah, so look at, uh, especially j just a question about the pool. As we know, the pool 2.0 is divided into three domains, the wrist, the elbow, and the shoulder. So when you saw these positive changes, was it across all domains or did you specifically see it in, in, in for instance, the elbow or the wrist domain or all, all three? So it did, it varied, it varied from participant to participant where we saw the improvements. And I, I did have a slide on that, but I don't have that here with me. Um, we did see a number of the changes coming through on the shoulder as well. Great, thank you. So here I just wanted to show you the data that on the um, muscle function and strength, so our pull to my the movie plate and the my grip and my pinch data looking at um, muscle strength. So when we look at, um, I'll start with the with the table, and the table just shows us the mean changes um, that we observe for each of those parameters um, over the dosing period from baseline to week 24, and what we see here is that we're showing a reduction in a reduction or a stabilization in the level of decline that the um, boys would normally expect to see. And what we're also seeing is that it's happening across multiple parameters um, over that six month period. And the spaghetti plots just show us the individual patients. And as you can see, it's just showing that the, um, on all those parameters, um, the patients are pretty much all going in that same direction. Here, what we did is the, um, we wanted to compare, as ours was an open label study and all boys were on treatment. We wanted to just get a sense of how our study compared to those results that I showed you earlier, compared to what's published in the literature. Now, these aren't um, matched or anything. This is just data taken from the literature. And we looked at um, the work published by Dr. Ricotti and her colleagues. And here we just compare our mean change to that reported by um, Dr. Ricotti for both the pinch, as you can see, we get a um, statistically significant difference between the, the um, means that, that we observed in the study versus the mean change. Our mean was a uh, change of zero versus the mean change of minus um, 0.38 or the 30th 
380 um, gram. And similarly with um, the group strength, we observed um, a change of 0.2 versus a minus 0.5. And again, that appeared to be significant when we um, applied a simple um, two-sided t-test to this data. Kit, we probably should also highlight that uh, that that publication was in uh, non ambulant boys of a similar age that were also on uh, corticosteroid treatment. Yes, thank you, Mark. Yes, good, thank you. And that brings us to now looking at the other. Um, aspect and looking at muscle structure and we did this with the use of MRI and um, we we assessed the dominant forearm in this study only the um, dominant side and we looked at um, the different muscle groups and what we observed was um, there was a main change in the percentage fat fraction um, was slightly reduced or we could say stable over all the three muscle groups that were um, that were examined in the MRIs, and then, and also in the overall fat fraction, in other words, the data there to show the minus 0.25 for that um, change in average fat fraction. As opposed to, a, and I'll, I'll share with you, I'll compare the data to the literature in a moment. Um, so this finding. Um, was further supported. We did the three reading central, proximal and distal, so um, in the MRI, and that was confirmed in both the proximal and distal readings as well. And this, this um, stabilisation, shall we say, of um, percentage fat fraction wasn't expected, is not expected in the natural course of the disease, even when the boys are on um, corticosteroid treatment. So this was an unexpected finding for us. And the stabilisation, what was also interesting is that when we looked at the, um, the total cross-sectional area of the um, muscle and then we subtracted the, the fat component of it to give us the remaining muscle area, which is basically the non-fat or the lean muscle mass, what we found is that... Um, we saw an increase in that um, parameter, so and that shows a mean change in our study over the 24 weeks of 13.9. And these two combined, a reduction or a stabilisation in the percentage fat fraction combined with this maintenance of the lean muscle mass suggests that 1102 may be preserving that functional muscle mass. And in that next slide, I just wanted to um, once again just compare to what's been reported in the literature and again um, in that paper by uh, Dr. Ricotti and her colleagues. They also reported, as Mark said, in a similar patient population um, with a similar age in non-ambulant boys. They reported obviously increases in percentage fat fraction across the different muscle groups and on average. While in our study, if you see in that column for the 1102 study data, it shows that these were actually a reduction in the fat fraction. And similarly, we see in the remaining muscle area, um, there is a positive change there of 13.9 compared to a loss of 32, and that's in um, millimetre squared. And on a couple of those parameters which we've highlighted, um, we did see uh, some statistically significant differences um, when we looked at the proximal reading for average fat fraction and the dorsal muscles in the central reading. Here, um, I just wanted to share with you um, some work that we did with Dr. Yonis Hogrell where um, I shared the data with him and he performed a 
uh, a correlation analysis looking at the lean muscle mass or, or area um, and correlating, looking for a correlation with that and grip strength, which you would expect. Um, the more, obviously, the more functional muscle mass um, you have, the, the greater the strength. In it. And this shows that we had a very a highly significant positive correlation um, between these parameters, which just confirms the consistency of our results across these different parameters of muscle structure and com with muscle force and strength. So it just shows that um, quality of the data that we generated out of study. So as I mentioned, we also looked at um, quality of life assessment. Now, as you know, we only had nine boys in the study, so it's a little difficult to interpret with the, with the variability that's inherent in these tools. But what we observed is that um, we had two of the teens perform their own um, assessments, while for the younger boys, the parents had performed their assessments on their behalf. And what we saw was that in both the teams, we saw mean improvements across all domains of communication, daily activities, treatment, and, and worry. Um, while in the um, younger patients where the parents completed the questionnaires, we again saw positive uh, changes in the daily activities and treatment that um, negative or, or declines in the worry and the communication domain. And, and we will assess this obviously um, in, the, in the next study, which will be much larger. Also, we looked at respiratory function. Similarly, this is a, a difficult one in such a small patient population, such a short-term study of um, only 24 weeks, and um, it's difficult to draw meaningful conclusions. But um, we, what we observed is the changes in percent predicted um, FEC for spinal capacity. We didn't see. Um, any improvement on what would be the normal expected decline. However, when we look at the um, percent PF assessment, we saw a slight mean increase in this parameter, which was consistent with the data that we've observed, you know, for the other parameters of structure and strength and function. Which brings me to our conclusion. So we, um, we can conclude that ATR1102 was found to be generally safe and well tolerated in our non-ambulant boys with CMD in this study. This novel antisense um, being developed for inflammation that exacerbates the muscle fibre damage um, in DMD appears to be demonstrating um, positive effects on the on a number of disease progression parameters assessed in this study. So um, we feel that what we're observing is an improvement in the muscle strength based on the observed mean change from baseline after 24 weeks of dosing um, when this was assessed by grip, my grip and my pinch compared to the losses that was reported in the literature as I, I shared with you earlier. And also that our data is suggested in improvements in muscle function, as assessed by the pool two tool, where we saw nine of the eight, sorry, apologies, seven of the nine um, patients demonstrating clinically meaningful improvements or stabilization in their pool two scores um, over the 24 weeks. The MRI data suggests um, stabilization of percentage fat in muscles and preservation of functional muscle mass. The MRI data, um, positive changes at the muscular and cellular level supports what we're observing, at, you know, the physical stabilization improvements in muscle strength and function. 
So the results we feel are promising and they support the continued development of HL1102 for the treatment of DMD. And on that note, I'll hand back over to Gil and Mark. Um, Thank you so much for that. We, we so appreciate it. And I know we're going on to talk about what happens next, but the correlation between the uh, fast fraction and the improvements in the pool as well as the pinch uh, strength is very nice and all pointing in the right direction. So that's very exciting for for not only the non-ambulant population, but for all the young men with Duchenne. So thank you for that. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much, Pat. Uh, I think what how you summarized was, as you may have seen in the concluding a paragraph there uh, the, that um, we incorporated from uh, Professor Voigt. You know, that it was his um, his view also that it was the you know, the fact that we're seeing the, the the correlations around improvements in grip and, uh, and uh, sorry in strength and function with those um, uh, MRI uh, uh, observations as well too that he he, he thinks is the really the most encouraging feature of, of the data. So as Niket said, that which brings us to kind of a next steps in the development of the drug. Uh, we've been uh, talking to the regulators in Europe. We've had uh, three meetings with the uh, national authorities in Europe and we have been um, very pleased with the feedback that we've received to date on our uh, intended trial design for this uh, next study of AT1102, where uh, you know, we're proposing to have uh, pool 2 and mice that is the primary endpoints, and looking to uh, dose uh, uh, for uh, one year and employ higher doses than what we uh, used in this initial study uh, at the Royal Children's Hospital, and so. Uh, what was uh, very pleasing to hear from those three national authorities, and they're very consistent with this view, is that uh, if uh, we ran the study over that duration and saw the type of positive benefits that we've seen in this initial study over the 12 months, that could be a path towards uh, an early or uh, what in Europe's known as a, as a conditional approval. So, uh, We've uh, submitted to the European Medicines Agency our uh, phase B trial design based on the interactions with the national authorities and the feedback we received from them. We said that uh, that uh, <coughs> feedback is due in the middle of the in the middle of this year, and and so in parallel, what we're intending to do is now uh, engage with the FDA uh, now that we have the results from the phase two. A clinical study that Niket has outlined today. Now we have that information to now look to establish a, a development plan or path for uh, H1102 in the US. And you know, this uh, final uh, or concluding slide that highlights uh, again next steps for us in uh, in the development of this drug. We um, hope, uh, expecting rather that the EU scientific guidance will come through shortly. Uh, we are, of course, um, working uh, now uh, closely with uh, key opinion leaders and advocacy groups such as uh, BPMD uh, on our uh, intentions for for the US. So we're you know, looking forward to report on our progress there and our um, uh, definitive plans for for drug development in the US. We're looking to submit for orphan drug designation in both the US and Europe, but with the proposal to submit an application and start our phase to be clinical trial in Europe. So, uh, Pat, that concludes our uh, presentation today. We're very pleased to take any uh, follow-on questions as, um, or any other uh, any other you know, queries that uh, you and or the team may have over the program. Sure. Um, I have a few questions, if you don't mind, Gil, and, and you, you, you may not see at this point or be able to tell us, 
but you talked about you started out at 25 mg per kg um, in the dose. And what is your target dose? Uh, you is this a dose escalation study? You'll begin. Um, how are you thinking about that? Maybe I'll uh, just uh, address that initially, and then and get Nick to comment as well to Mark here. Uh, it's not 25 milligrams per kilogram, Pat. It's actually just a fixed dose of 25 milligrams. Oh, so sorry. Yes, rel- you're right. Relative- I, I apologize. No, that's okay because, uh, of course, I think, um, you know, with the experience with uh, drugs like Ateplicin, of course, that is dosed on a, on a weight basis. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it is, uh, it is a, 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 you know, a, a relatively low dose. Uh, and that's why for the next study we are, you're contemplating two higher doses to establish a you know, dose response in the phase 2B. Did you want to comment on that further, Niket? Uh, yeah, that's exactly right, Mark. We are contemplating um, for the next study two doses of well, ATL1102 that are higher than what we used in this study. Okay. Uh, but do you... You haven't determined the target dose, and I apologize. I think in mg per kg, and I because that's most of the studies. So at 25 milligrams, you're, are you can you tell us the target dose that you think might be the dose you want to get to, or is that still in that, discussion? Yeah, that that's what we've proposed, and I've provided the justifications for my dose selection and to go forward with fixed dose to maintain the fixed dose. Um, based on the PK data from this study and earlier studies as well. So that's what's been discussed at the EMA for that scientific advice. And it would be good to have their feedback before we obviously determine what those doses will be. Sure. And and so um, will you, your, your, this, this early trial that you've done with the nine patients was a non-ambulant population. How do you see the studies going forward? Will you stick to the... Um, non-ambulant population, or are you going to think about doing a, a, a more inclusive across the trajectory? How, are you, are, is that still in discussion, or how are you thinking about that? For no, the uh, phase two B, yeah. oh, thanks, Nick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the phase two B trial, it, it will be non-ambulant boys, in, so the demographic will be, you know, very similar to. Those that we uh, that we enrolled for the, you know, the initial proof of concept study at the Royal Children's Hospital, and you know, we are obviously uh, looking at the drugs potential in, uh, in the broader population, as you highlighted, uh, Pat. That's something that you know we are, you know very keen to explore with um, you know key opinion leaders, and and uh, know that uh, Gill. And is keen to follow that up with uh, with experts in the U.S. as to uh, the, the appropriateness of you know expanding the clinical development into say you know, the ambulant population as well too. But uh, this next study at, that we're looking to conduct in Europe would be yeah in non non ambulant boys. And the same in the U.S. as well. That's still to be determined, and uh, that. Uh, you know, what we are now kind of reviewing with uh, with the ex- clinical experts, and hope to also follow up with the uh, with the FDA. I might get guild to to comment on that as well too. Um, to just yep. uh, give a sense of how we how we how we're thinking about moving moving forward there. Right. So so um, you know, building a clinical development plan is a little bit like building a house. You know, you, you sort of put up one block at a time. The way that I would characterize this study is that this is an important cornerstone to how the house is going to be built. This this study uh, gives us uh, great encouragement to move forward into all of those things, Pat. And by the way, it's good to hear your voice again. Um, Thank you. It gives us uh, encouragement to move forward with individuals like you, uh, PPMD, uh, other thought leaders uh, in the clinic, uh, uh, to come back and say, okay, we've got this cornerstone. Where do we go from here? For example, as you rightly mentioned early on, 
do we think that it is plausible that this would have an impact on the heart? And we do. But we have to look at that. We have to study that, capture that data in a way uh, that we didn't do in this in this first study. Uh, but we certainly will moving forward uh, in subsequent studies. So, so right now where we are, I'm trying to take the lead in the U.S. Uh, again, with reaching out to individuals like yourself, uh, some other key opinion leaders, so that I can go back uh, to our our management, our team, and say this looks like the path forward. Uh, and again, maybe with a, a, a higher dose. Um, that's one of the things that we need to look at. Um, so I, I hope that that sort of illustrates or highlights where we are. We've got a, a great cornerstone to what I believe will be a mansion uh, down the road. At least I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it will be a mansion down the road. Yeah, from your lips to God's ears, Gil. I think right. that uh, <laughs> right. for all of us, right. we, we certainly we know that drug development is is building a house, maybe building a mansion as well. And and I think there, you know, especially in the non-ambulatory population, there many of the studies have focused on an ambulatory population. So we're right. very happy to see um, because every person with Duchenne deserves opportunities to um, participate in trials and hopefully access to therapies as well. So um, I, I think this is pretty amazing. In addition to, you probably already know, the Imaging DMD group in the UI, U.S. is looking to qualify for fat fraction um, as, a, uh, as a biomarker. So I think your use yes. of fat fraction um, in, in the arm function is, is really an important step as well. And clearly the heart, right? The heart is a muscle, too, and we're all concerned about um, how to – make sure that we preserve these hearts as we preserve function in these kids. So I think this is terrific. So just thinking about the study, and I'm making a guess now, I would assume that the study will be up and running in Europe first, and then you will uh, sequentially come into the U.S. shortly thereafter. Is that the hopeful plan at the mansion and mansion for now? Yeah, I think that that's it. I believe that that's it. But we, again, you know, we're, we're so encouraged. We're going out. We're, we're trying to look for ways that we can accelerate all of our programs, whether it's Europe or U.S., we we just that encouraged by this early data. Yeah, well, I think that the early data is very encouraging, especially that it's correlated across. Right? You didn't you didn't see any glitches in in looking at fat fraction and then looking at uh, at the pool and then looking at the grip. So all of that was going in the right direction. And I agree that the right. 24 months is long enough to really look at um, force vital capacity and the, po- the respiratory measures, uh, or to get a really adequate look. Especially measuring fat fraction against Ricotti's publication, I think is is terrific, and it does it does give us great hope that this is indeed a mansion um, and and could be uh, certainly synergistic with other therapies that are coming online for Duchenne. So one of the questions here was, is this next trial listed on clinicaltrials.gov? And I can think I can say it is not listed on clinicaltrials.gov as, at this moment until the study is until they get scientific advice, the EMA agrees that the study can go forward, and then, and as well as the FDA, um, then these these clinical trials will be posted online. The data That's looks right. quite interesting, and, and we're, first of all, very grateful that you're in Duchenne. Uh, you know, uh, I um, we've been long waiting for wonderful therapies for Duchenne and mansions to be built, so we're very hopeful that this will indeed be one mansion that certainly is is effective for all the boys. And the fact that it can target skeletal muscle and hopefully um, cardiac muscle is also a terrific opportunity as we think about um, the question of extending function for long periods of time and a potential negative impact on the heart. So treating both at the same time is really, really important. Well, I can't thank all of you enough. Gil Gil and Mark and Nukat, this has been wonderful. We're excited. We're thrilled to have you both in Europe and the U.S. I think I think that's the way to go. Um, boys all over the globe need your help. So thank you very much for this encouraging data. If there's anything we or this community can do, we're behind you all the way. Thank you for looking at the non-ambulatory population. This is a critical piece of information we need, and certainly boys that um, really need and deserve our help as well. So thank you very much. We're just at the top of the hour. Any final comments from any of you? No, I need to say, you know, thank you very much, Pat, for in the opportunity in, to, to present on the program. And we're very excited to be working you know, with you and, and, and your team. And, 
And so, you know, we uh, look forward to re- reporting on our continued positive um, development progress. So but, uh, just once again, we, we really appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, uh, talk today on our trial results. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you soon, both in Europe and the U.S., with these clinical trials posted. Um, we would certainly be willing and anxious to help you recruit and, and help you be successful in any way we can. So thank you for joining us. For all of you that stayed online, thank you, too, for joining us. Stay safe and have a good rest of your day. Thank you again.